This is where we left off last time. Thomas Jefferson, who our school is named after, right? Third president of the United States. All right, what was the scandalous story about Thomas Jefferson that was going around back in those days in the newspapers? Who remembers? It was a scandalous story. Anybody know? Did we chat about this last time? It was a scandal in the papers. What was it? Do you remember? He what? Yeah, the scandal was that he had a child with one of his slave women, young women. Now, you know, I, there were some slave owners. Slavery, that is a horrible, horrible chapter in our history. It turns my stomach to think about it, but it happened. Um, some slave owners, um, to be blunt, would rape their, their slaves. I mean, they just they had control over them. Now, according to the letters and the diaries and the documents of the time, it appears that Thomas Jefferson actually really was in love with Sally Hill. And, and so, I do not believe that it was a coercive kind of a thing. It is said that she sometimes went on trips with him, like he would sometimes go to France, okay, as a statesman, statesman of the country, he would go to France, um, and she would accompany him. So, it wasn't, uh, a forced situation. I can't be positive, but I would bet it wasn't forced. And um, her son, Easton Hemings, was not a field slave, not, not a, a servant who worked out in the field, hard work in the hot sun and all that stuff. He was a house servant, well-dressed. Thomas Jefferson took good care of him. Thomas looked after his education, make sure, made sure Easton got an education, which was unusual at that time. Um, so, the rumors were floating around that Easton was the child, the illegitimate child of Thomas Jefferson. It was in the newspapers, and uh, he denied it. Now, did he show up on CNN or Fox or uh, MSNBC? No, they didn't have it in those days, right? But it was, it was kind of a scandal. So, for years, people have speculated, did that really happen? Did, did Thomas Jefferson really do that? Well, the easiest way to do that would be to find a descendant of Easton Hemings, right? And do DNA testing on his Y chromosome. And then do DNA testing on Thomas Jefferson's Y chromosome, right? What's the problem with that? Okay. Thomas Jefferson turned to dust a long time ago. Okay? You can't, you just can't get his Y chromosome. So I want to show you how they did this. And I think it was kind of interesting, kind of clever how this was pulled off. Okay. Can you see that back here at all? More or less? Okay. All right, let me show you what's what we have going here. This shows the lineage of the descendants of Easton Hemings. Okay, so we'll start right here. Here's a guy, he's alive today. Today. His name is John Weeks Jefferson. And this has been documented. They've got the family tree all documented, written down. He knows that his dad was William McGill Jefferson, who was the son of Carl Smith Jefferson, who was the son of a man named Beverly Jefferson, who was the son of Easton, the son of Sally Hemings. Are you following that? How should John Weeks Jefferson's Y chromosome compare to his dad's Y chromosome? 
would be the same, which would be the same as Carl Smith's, <laughs> same as Beverly's, same as Easton's. Why would Easton Hemmings Y chromosome not be like Sally Hemmings Y chromosome? Shouldn't have one. Right, good. Shouldn't have one. Just checking to see if you're awake. But if Thomas Jefferson was the father of Easton Hemmings, then Easton's Y chromosome should be just like Thomas Jefferson's, right? Okay, so here's what they did. John Weeks Jefferson knows he's the descendant of Easton. He knows that. It's all documented, all written down. So they did DNA testing of John's Y chromosome. All right, now that's great. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to have Thomas Jefferson's Y chromosome, but that's impossible. But let me tell you about Thomas Jefferson. Thomas was the son of Peter Jefferson. Peter Jefferson had a brother named Field. Field Jefferson. You with me? Since Peter and Field were brothers, how would their Y chromosomes compare? Same. The same. Okay. They found a direct descendant of Field Jefferson, who's alive today. They did DNA testing on his Y chromosome and it matched this guy's John. Aha. Uh -huh. See? That's how they did it. Make sense? So the scandal is true. Uh pretty sure. But of course, you can never be a hundred percent sure about anything, but you can be pretty sure. Pretty sure. Pretty sure. But like I said, the letters and diaries and documents of the time suggest that Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings were actually in love. This was after this was after his wife had died. So they weren't married, but that was really scandalous to him, you know, that was but that's the story. So it's interesting how they used DNA testing, right? Genetic analysis to kind of puzzle through this mystery here. Actually, uh, so that, bless you, so that was sort of like indirect paternity testing, but paternity testing is like the leading application of DNA fingerprinting nowadays. In fact, here's an ad for a company that does that. Paternity testing with legal results, DNA testing direct from the world leader, starting at $449 but they crossed it out. They said you can call for discounts. Okay. Well, there's the 800 number. So that's a company that does that. All right. I want to see if we can do some real analysis of DNA fingerprints here. Okay. See if you guys can do it. You've got everything you need to know in order to do this. Uh, here is a photograph of a gel and uh, A and A, these two lanes, A and A, so here's person A, here's his DNA fingerprint, here's the other person A, his twin, A, A is a twin pair, his DNA fingerprint, okay, and you can compare the DNA fingerprints of the two. Here's another pair of twins, B and B, here's another pair of twins, C and C. Uh, here's another pair of twins, D and D. Raise your hand when you can see which twin pairs are identical twins. Identical twins. Sarah, which ones are identical? C. Yeah, the two C's are identical. Look at their DNA fingerprints. They match up band for band, right? Are the two, A, two B's? Yeah, the two B's are identical. I mean, they're, sh they're shifted just a little because maybe maybe this one was just positioned a little bit lower here, but yeah. But the two A's are definitely not identical. Okay, you guys know any you guys know any twins that are non-identical twins, fraternal twins in this school? 
<laughs> oh wait, I've got a couple in black four. That's right. Yeah, a boy and a girl. Yeah. Uh, here's another DNA fingerprint. Now this is a, from a paternity case. Okay. So here's the situation. M is for mama. M is the mother. See her DNA fingerprint? And C is the child. F1, that's father candidate number one. And F2 is father candidate number two. All right, now look carefully at especially the two father candidates and which, see if you can decide which one is the likely father in this paternity case. Raise your hand if you think you can see it. Which one? Alexis, do you know which? That person. Father number one? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Good eye. Excellent. You're right. And uh, the little red, the little red rectangles kind of outline the bands that sh that illustrate that or show that. That's a paternity suit or paternity case right there. Now, okay, so father number two candidate, he's off the hook. Okay, he's he's not the dad. Here's another DNA fingerprint. Now this is from a crime scene. Wow, in this case they had seven suspects. Wow. Goodness, seven suspects. One of them is the guilty one. Mm, the middle DNA fingerprint, this lane right here, that's a DNA obtained from a blood stain at the crime scene. Blood from the perpetrator, the bad guy. Um, raise your hand when you think you can see which suspect matches the crime scene. Uh, pretty obvious. Which one? Yep. Number three. See how they match up? That's how they do this. See, you guys could do this. You guys could do this. You can read those things. Right? Making the gels, that, that's fairly involved. But uh, you guys could do it. All right, I want to show you another example of how DNA fingerprinting has been put to use. You're thinking, what? Do you know who that is? Yeah. Yeah, that's me. Glacier National Park. Do you guys know where Glacier National Park is? Uh, well, it's kind of like that in Montana. Oh. Montana. A uh, big national park out there. And beautiful country. I was out there at a workshop for high school biology teachers. We were learning about ecology and how they use DNA fingerprinting in wildlife management. That's what we were doing. Okay. It was in September, early September, so I had to miss a few days of school. There were about 12 of us high school biology teachers from all over the country gathered together learning from these experts out there, okay? So, man, I'll tell you what, talk about beautiful country. Glacier National Park, it's up in high mountains, there are glaciers up there. Sadly, the glaciers are disappearing. And it's not going to be long, it's not going to be long when, ironically, Glacier National Park is not going to have any glaciers because they are disappearing. You guys know why they're disappearing? Climate change. Um, the higher elevations are more susceptible to the effects of climate change and show the effects sooner than lower elevations. How do we know it's not... I mean, a normal cycle? Yeah. Well, some people argue it's just a normal cycle. Okay. Um, most climatologists, scientists who specialize in the study of climate, would say there's evidence, though, that humans have accelerated it with, um, from burning fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. So, but then there are people who don't want to believe that. <laughs> So, it gets pretty crazy, and it gets political, so, anyway, there we were, oh, 
We did a lot of hiking out there, learning about the ecology of the area. Now this was early September, I mean right after Labor Day, okay? And there's still snow up here in the mountains, you can see. But this sign I remember caught my eye, entering grizzly country. It's like, whoa, okay. Do you know what happens? Do you know what you're supposed to do if a grizzly bear chases you? Play dead. You're supposed to play dead while he mauls you and tears you up. <laughs> Not much you can do, but there's some, there's some protective things you can do. Like when you're out hiking, be with a bunch of people. Uh, be with people who run slower than you do. That's the first thing. <laughs> There was a lady in our group who, uh, she had to be on crutches, and I remember thinking, well, I'm, I'm safe. No, I didn't really. I didn't really think that. I'm sorry. I re well, actually, the thought crossed my mind, and then I said to myself, self, that's terrible. Don't think that. So, no, the easiest thing to do is be pre practice protective safety, or preventative safety. In other words, walk in a big group and um, make lots of noise. So you don't like surprise a grizzly bear on the trail or something. So that's what you're supposed to do. And they talk about carrying bear spray, which shoots out in the stream and like makes the bear's eyes burn or whatever. So anyway, you just don't want to be attacked by a grizzly bear. But they're putting up that sign so everybody would know about the dangers. Now, what's interesting is Okay, Glacier National Park, big national park, lots of wildlife, and there are park rangers that work there, and there are scientists that work there, and there are biologists that work there, and wildlife biologists, and their job is to manage and make sure, keep tabs on the wildlife populations. I mean, it's helpful for them to know how many grizzly bears there are in the park, and to keep records on all the grizzly bears. Now in the olden days, before genetic engineering or before DNA fingerprinting, if they wanted to keep records on all these grizzly bears in the park for purposes of wildlife management, what they had to do was set up these big live traps, which are like big wooden boxes with a sliding door that comes down when the bear goes inside and trips the trap, you know what I'm talking about? And uh, they would have to hire people. You need a lot of hands when you're doing this. They'd have to hire people, of course, to build these big traps and bait them and then tranquilize the bear. Once a bear wandered in there and got caught in the trap, then they'd have to like shoot a tranquilizer through a little window, put the bear to sleep. And then when the bear was asleep under the tranquilizer, then they would weigh the bear, take measurements, take blood samples and all that kind of stuff to keep keep records on all these grizzly bears in the park. Big job. Requires a lot of people. Kind of dangerous. It's very invasive to the bear. I mean, it's, they try to keep things natural in a national park. But it's not really natural for a bear to get shot with a tranquilizer dart and then put to sleep. And then groggily wake up from that and then run away afterwards while the the people run away. <laughs> that's not really natural, right? It's kind of invasive. But that's how they would take measurements of the bears, keep track of them, keep careful records of all the bears in the park. Individual records. Each bear has his or her own individual record on file, okay? It took a lot of people to do that. <clears throat> so when DNA fingerprinting came along, the biologists that worked there came up with a better idea. Why don't you just collect DNA samples from the bears instead of trapping them in these big live boxes and then having people have to measure, take all these records for each individual bear. Why not just collect DNA from the bears, make DNA fingerprints of the bears, keep those DNA fingerprints on file because those are individual. No two DNA fingerprints are alike. Remember that? And so that, that's how they do it. Now the question is, how do you get DNA from a grizzly bear? 
there's a hint in this picture. Anybody know how? Yeah, the bears are known to come to certain trees and like scratch their backs on the trees. Bears, they do, they like to do that. And uh, like, for example, let's pretend that I'm a grizzly bear and this is a, this is a tree right here. They'll, they'll come over and they'll just, oh, I feel so good. That's what they do. They like to do that. I guess, you know, they have lice and ticks and things like that. And it just probably feels good because they're itching and everything. So they located, identified trees where they knew grizzly bears did that because they would set up these motion sensitive cameras at night and they would capture videos of the bears scratching themselves on the trees. That's what the bears like to do. And so then what they would do is they would wrap barbed wire. Can you see the barbed wire around this tree? This is a tree that was known to be a tree that grizzly bears would scratch their backs on. And so they wrapped barbed wire around here so that when the grizzly bear would rub up against it, it didn't, didn't hurt the grizzly bear. They've got thick skin and fat and everything. It doesn't hurt them. They probably even like the little barbs on the barbed wire. You know, that feels good, more scratching. And so the bears would do that, and then when the bear would leave, the bear would leave little tufts of fur on the barbs on the barbed wire. Little, little pieces of hair. And then later on, the biologists, would, the wildlife biologists, would come through and collect the little bits of hair off of those barbs, take those back to the lab, extract DNA from them, and then do DNA fingerprints. And then now they've got DNA fingerprints for all these bears in the park, individual records, so they can kind of keep, keep them all straight. Kind of interesting. So that's a whole lot easier and having a bunch of people build a big live trap, bait it, have the bear go in, it's kind of dangerous for the people. Tranquilize the bear and collect information from the bear that way. It kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Out in the woods. Another use of DNA fingerprinting. You guys ever seen that? No? All right, now. Let's take a look at page eight. Hey, Jay. I haven't told you guys everything about DNA fingerprinting yet. There's a little bit more to it than what we did in the lab, okay? When you guys did that DNA fingerprinting lab, I have to confess to you that that wasn't real human DNA in that kit, okay? It was virus DNA, a particular virus called Lambda. It's safe, you don't have to worry about it. But a virus, you know, is very simple. Its genome's not all that big compared to ours. And so it's not a very long DNA molecule in that virus. And so when they cut that DNA with a restriction enzyme, it made just two fragments. That's all. Remember when you ran the gels and you had two bands? They're just two fragments. If you took uh, human DNA and printed out all the letters, okay, use Times New Roman font, 12 point size. No spaces between the letters. Remember all the A's and T's and C's and G's in DNA? No spaces between the letters no margins, left or right or up or down, single spaced, and print on both sides of the paper. Then the recipe for a human being, all the DNA sequence, all three billion bases, would be a stack of those papers as tall as the Washington Monument. So our genome is pretty big. The virus would be like one page. So that's what they used in that kit that you guys used. It was virus DNA that when you hit it with a restriction enzyme, you only get two fragments and you see two bands on the gel. If you really did 
human DNA that way. Let me show you what you would get. Okay, this is what you would get if you really did human DNA. Let's say that this is a gel, and there's a well, and there's a well, and there's a well, and there's a well. And Justin's DNA we're going to put in that well. Alexis, yours is in there. Okay. Um, Maria, there's yours. And here's mine. Okay. So if you collected Justin's DNA, we had it in the test tube. Okay, your genome is really big. Remember, tall as Washington Monument? If we added a restriction enzyme to your DNA in that tube, we would get millions of fragments. Millions. And if you ran them through the gel, this is what you'd get. Okay, I'm going to draw the, the bands in here. Thousands, millions of bands, all one smeared into another. Are you with me? And if we did a Lexus DNA, this is what we did. This is what we get. Millions of fragments. Impossible to tell them apart, right? I'm not going to do Maria's and mine. Maria, yours and mine would be just alike, just just like this. A s continuous smear of millions of fragments. You couldn't tell them apart. So you see the problem here? So, if you want to try to tell the difference between these people, if you want to identify certain key bands that are different between these people. It's like trying to find what? A needle in a haystack. It's like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Now if you had a haystack like this and there was a needle in here, how might you go about finding it? Somebody give me a, a strategy. If you had Alexis? A metal oh excellent! A metal detector. Just go in there with a metal detector. Somebody once said, well, you could just jump in the stack and maybe you'd find it. That's dangerous. Yeah, kind of dangerous. Uh, but yeah, I like your idea. Metal detector, you could probably find it in there. So that metal detector would be what you would use to probe around in there, right, and try to find it. Like a probe. You're trying to probe around in that stack and find that needle. And you know what they use in situations like this? They use little tools called probes. Okay, so at the top of page, back to the study guide. At the top of page eight, there's a little definition for the type of probe, the type of probe we're gonna be talking about here. So why don't you guys go ahead and write this down, this definition right here, DNA probes. For purposes of the type of DNA fingerprinting we're talking about right here, short, single-stranded pieces of radioactive DNA that will stick to the DNA sequence of interest, the DNA sequence that we're trying to find. We call those probes. You guys got that written down? Very important. Okay, short, single-stranded pieces of radioactive DNA that will stick to the DNA sequence of interest. They make these probes artificially in the lab. They make them in the lab. There are certain machines called DNA machines that you can make little pieces of DNA in the lab. There's like a keyboard with four letters, A, T, C, and G. Make sense? Let's see, I want to make a probe that, uh, that is made up of the bases or the letters A, T, G, 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 C, C, T, okay. And these are radioactive. So in other words, when they make these little pieces of DNA, they use radioactive phosphorus. Remember the, nod your head, Jess, if you remember this. Remember how the sides of the DNA molecule, the sides of the ladder, alternating sugar and phosphate, okay? They use radioactive phosphorus when they make these probes so that the DNA molecule that they make is radioactive. Now, they make these probes up 
so that the order of the bases, the letters, is opposite of the piece that they're trying to find in that haystack. Actually, we don't say opposite, we say complementary. Okay, quick little review. What base is complementary to A? What sticks to A? T. What base is complementary to C? What sticks to C? Remember that stuff? Okay, so here's how this works. Here's how they use those probes. Okay, let's say this is a double-stranded DNA molecule, and it's a fragment it's a fragment on a gel, okay? Electrophoresis has been done, and that's a fragment on a gel. Hey, y'all with me? You guys with me? Yeah. Okay, it's a fragment on a gel, and uh, the next thing they do is denature this DNA fragment. Now watch carefully, and then you tell me what denature means. Here we go. Uh, there's the DNA, and... Okay, so what's denature mean? Angie, what does it mean? Split apart. So if you take a DNA molecule, look at here, double-stranded DNA. Well, it's like that, right? <laughs> but let's say it's, okay, here it is, double-stranded DNA. If you add a little bit of heat or certain chemicals, you can make that DNA unzip, split apart. That's called denaturing the DNA, okay? So they denature the DNA. They make up this radioactive probe in the lab, like I told you about here. Now, these little asterisks are stars on it. That means it's radioactive. Watch this. Red. It's hot. Okay? It's radioactive. And it, the order of the bases, they made that up in the lab, is the opposite or complementary to the piece that they're looking for in that DNA fingerprint. And so when they add the probe, see how it sticks right here to this sequence right there? See how the probe stuck? Because G pairs with C and A is attracted to T and T to A and C to G. See that? See how a probe works? Now, that probe, since it's radioactive, if they lay a piece of Film, x-ray film on top of that, it's going to make a dark spot right there where the probe stuck. And that's kind of the basis of how probes work. So if we go back to uh, this diagram here, that means maybe they could have made up a probe, probe molecules that would stick here, make a dark spot there, a dark spot there. And then they can see they can pull out just certain key sequences, and then they can tell people apart. Now you're gonna guess if this kind of makes sense. This kind of makes sense. Probes. Now, on the next page of your study guide, page nine. Now this is a good page to study, or to really have with you when you're taking that quiz on Friday. Okay, this page right here. Because it tells you step by step just what I went through. And this procedure is called Southern blotting. Do you know who invented it? Somebody whose last name was Southern. It's called Southern blotting. Now the, another similar procedure came along later where you could separate out and probe for RNA molecules, and that's called northern blotting. But the person who invented it, that, that person's last name was not northern. They just called it northern blotting because a person named southern invented southern blotting. Okay, now, so this is a page right here you really want to study, have with you when you take the quiz on Friday. And it just goes, like I said, through all the steps I just talked about. And here's a picture that shows that, okay? There's a picture that shows it. There are the steps. You can kind of follow them. Let's go through it again right here, okay? Here's how they do it. Southern blotting. You're going to see why it's called blotting here in a second. Let me grab
a sip of coffee. Good stuff. Okay, let's look at it. These are the steps. Okay, so here's a gel with all these DNA fragments on it. Little pieces, fragments of double-stranded DNA. We did electrophoresis. Next step is we denature that. In other words, use either a little bit of heat or some chemicals to make all those double-stranded fragments separate in the single strands. And then you take this sheet of a type of filter paper nitrocellulose paper. It's a type of filter paper. And you lay it on top of the gel and you blot it. See what's called southern blotting? And what happens then is the single stranded fragments stick to that paper when they peel it off and then on the paper you've got these single stranded fragments stuck to that paper in the exact same pattern that they were on the gel. The paper is a little sturdier than the gel. Remember how the gels would like break apart in your fingers? Okay, so the paper is a little more permanent, a little more, a little sturdier. Watch what they do next. It says hybridize with radioactive probe. Hybridize means make it stick to. So when the probe sticks to a DNA fragment, we say it is hybridized to the fragment. Okay, so you add the radioactive probes then to the, the paper that's got the single-stranded pieces of DNA on it. And then you place this grayish x-ray film on top of it. And when you peel that away, wherever radioactive probes stuck, they make these dark spots on the x-ray film. See that? Make sense? Now, those are all the steps there printed out. This is like the diagrammatic form of it. And since this is, this is like totally new, isn't it? All right, since it's totally new, um, let's actually do it right here. Let's demonstrate it right here, okay? All right, so let's pretend that this is a gel. We've done electrophoresis. Okay, look at here. Here's a well, there's a well, there's a well, there's a well. This is the negative end up here. This is the positive end. Remember how the DNA molecules are negatively charged? So they move to the positive end. So we've done electrophoresis, and these are the bands of four different people. Okay. All right, so with southern blotting, what would you do next? What would you do next? We run the gel. Okay, what do we do next? What comes after running the electrophoresis? What, what happens next? Denature. You denature these DNA fragments, split them all into single strands. Oh, yeah. And then what do you do? Justin, what do you do next? You transfer Yeah, you lay that nitrocellulose filter paper on top of this and you blot it on top of this. So let's do this. I just happen to have a, a sheet here of nitrocellulose filter paper. See? I'm going to lay it on top here. Blot, 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 blot. And I'm going to peel it off. See, did it work? Tell me, did it work? Oh, really worked. Okay, I'll get rid of the gel. Okay, yeah, it worked. Here they are. Okay, now we've got these single-stranded DNA fragments transferred onto this filter paper. Uh, what do we do next? Make one. Sarah's going to help. What do we do next? Well, not quite yet. We have to add something to this uh, this uh, filter paper. Yeah, we've got to add the probe molecules to this. The probes 
those radioactive pieces of DNA that will stick to certain sequences of interest on here. So to show that, I'm going to use a red marker to illustrate that it's hot. They're, those probes are hot. They're radioactive. We'll use red. Okay, red seems like... I'm wearing a red shirt, but I'm not hot, okay? <laughs> Although, when my wife first met me, I think she thought I was hot. I think. Oh, uh, Mr. Roll, stop. Is that what you're thinking? Okay, that's a different kind of hot, right? Oh. <laughs> okay, so let's add the radioactive probes. Here we go. Mm. Some of the radioactive probe molecules stick there. Some of them stick there. Some of them stick there. Some stick there. Some stick there. Some stick there. Some stick there. And there. And there, and there. Does that make sense? Now we can see that, but the radioactive probes are invisible. You really can't see them. So we have to do something else. All right, now that the radioactive probe molecules have been added to this sheet of nitrocellulose paper, what do we do next? Maria, what happens next? What's the next step? According to that diagram, we've added the probes. Now, what do we do? Justin's going to help. We're going to lay the x ray film on top of this. In every place where radioactive probe molecules have stuck, they're going to make a dark spot on the x ray film. Okay, so here's, I happen to have a sheet of x-ray film right here, so let's lay it on top of here. Okay, see, we're going to lay it on top of this. Let it cook. Peel back the uh, x-ray film, and see, check it out. See, every place where there was a radioactive probe molecule it stuck on the filter paper it made a dark spot on this x-ray film see so this x-ray film it's real sturdy it's not gooey crushy crumbly like a gel is it's pretty sturdy you can put it in a file folder or something to pin it up on a bulletin board this is the dna fingerprint okay so when you look at like photographs of DNA fingerprints, like the one that this guy's studying right here. See, he's looking at a sheet of that. It's, it's like x-ray film. That's what he's looking at. Photographic film or x-ray film. And every place where you see a dark spot is where probe molecules have stuck. That's how they do it. Does that make sense? That's how it's done. That's how you find the needle in the haystack. Now, actually, there's even a newer way of doing DNA fingerprinting than southern blotting. There's a newer way, but we'll get into that later. Not today. All right, you guys need a brain break. Okay. All right, new topic. The Human Genome Project. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of it. Excellent. What do you know about it? Is it the genome of a human? Say what? Is it the genome of a human? Yeah, genome of a human. Time out. What's your genome? What's a genome? Yeah, it's all your DNA. Remember I said all your DNA, if you printed it out, would be a stack of papers as high as the Washington Monument? We have a pretty big genome. Um, they all, just do one person? No, good question. They did several, several people. And they didn't just do people. At the same time that they were doing people, they also did mice, rats, monkeys, plants, certain kind of plants. They did bacteria, E. coli. E. coli was one of the very first things sequenced. What did they use to do? Ah, how did they do it? 
Like, how did they figure out the order of the bases? Well, what did they use? Like, blood, spit? Oh, you mean like from humans? Yeah. Actually, that's a good question. I don't know if it was blood or spit. I would guess spit. Because you can spit in a cup like we did. When you Remember when you extracted your yeah. DNA and you can get millions of cheek cells in that saliva and you can get DNA from those. And how did they do it? Ah, oh, good question. How do you take a tube of DNA and go from that to figuring out what the order of all the bases is? What's the sequence? What's the order of A's and T's and C's and G's? Like, how in the world do you do that? Okay, tell you what. It's an involved process. We're going to do a lab Monday. No, I'm giving you the background information. Monday, Bronco Day. And then Wednesday next week, we're going to do a lab where you will be able to see how they did that. Now, we're not using real DNA in the lab. We're using four different colors of paper clips representing the four bases. It's a DNA sequencing, kind of a simulation. And you'll be able to see, oh, that's how they did it. That's how they figured out the order of the bases. That's how they figured out the recipe for a human. Okay. Can you hang in there until then, Alexis? Yeah. To get the answer? Yeah. Okay. We're going to learn all about how DNA sequencing is done. So they did E. coli, they did different plants, they did corn, they did soybeans. Actually, one of the very first plants they did was a sort of the laboratory rat of the plant world, a little plant called Arabidopsis. They did a lot of different living things. They've even done the chimpanzee genome and, oh, the Neanderthal genome. Because they were able to collect enough DNA from Neanderthal skeletons from around the world, piece it all together, sequence it, so we, we even have the Neanderthal sequence. Now, <clears throat> my wife gave me for Christmas this 23andMe kit. You ever heard of that? Where you can spit in a little tube and send it off and they'll sequence your DNA. And I, I'm getting my results back. I'm getting emails every once in a while with results. And it's really interesting looking through the results. I found out that I have 260 variants, little key sequences, that are also in Neanderthal DNA. Hmm, interesting. Neanderthal DNA. I guess that kind of makes sense. Now, our cousins, the, the Neanderthals, they're extinct. Uh, we're still going. But our cousins, the Neanderthals, they died out what, 30, 40,000 years ago, something like that. They're extinct, but we survived. But there's evidence that our ancestors mated with some Neanderthals and that they, that they mixed. And so I wonder what that was like. Can you imagine if you were, Justin, imagine if you're a prehistoric human, our species, Homo sapiens sapiens, and you're out wandering around hunting for food 40,000 years ago. And you spy this Neanderthal girl who you think looks pretty nice. And you, <laughs> the two of you, you look at each other, you wave at each other. She's a little stockier than you, okay? Neanderthals were strong and strong, okay? And you take her home to meet your parents in your cave, okay? I wonder how your parents would have reacted if you had brought home a Neanderthal girl. Hmm. See how that kind of worked? <laughs> Something like that. So it's no wonder that I have that I have 260 Neanderthal variants in my DNA. I, I bet we all do. I bet we all do. I'm sure we all do. Have some. So anyway, Human Genome Project. This was amazing stuff, I remember. It was a 15-year international cooperative effort 
They started it in October of 1990. They estimated that they would probably finish the project, end up with that stack of papers as tall as the Washington Monument, the recipe for humans. They figured they would uh, finish that within uh, by, by September 30th, 2005. But as it turns out, the project was finished ahead of schedule and under budget. Now, in other words, it cost less than they thought it would. And it didn't take as long as they thought it would. And this was predominantly a federally funded project, funded by the US government, tax dollars. I think it's probably the only federally funded government project that finished ahead of schedule and under budget. Amazing. Anybody want to take a guess as to why they probably finished ahead of schedule? It wasn't as hard as they thought it was. Well, it was hard. It was as hard as they thought. That's a good guess, though. There were a lot of people working together. Good. There were a lot of people working together. And the automation and the computer technology did what from 1990 to 2003? It got better and faster. The robots that they used, I mean, they didn't do it all by hand, okay? There were robots, there was automation, there, were, there was computer software controlling all the processes all along the way. The robots, the automation, the technology, the computers, the software got better and better and better, and it sped up as it went, okay? It kind of accelerated, that's why, technology. Uh, but there were several countries involved. Brazil. Oh, it's too bad Marina's not still here. Oh, man, she would see her country listed first right there. Canada, China, Denmark, European Union, France, Germany, Israel, Italy, Japan, Mexico, Netherlands, Russia, Sweden, United Kingdom, USA. So, a lot of countries involved in working out this, basically, this recipe. So, uh, the, the leader, the director of the whole project was this guy right here. His name is Dr. Francis Collins. He was the director. Now, when he was tapped to do this, to head up this project, he was actually at the University of Michigan. Now, the cool thing about this guy, okay, get this. You think you've been in school a long time? <laughs> He uh, has a PhD, he has a medical degree. He's a doctor, medical doctor. So he's been to medical school. But then he also has a PhD. So he went to school a long time. He was a geneticist at the University of Michigan. It was he and the people in his lab who identified and located the cystic fibrosis gene. And uh, so he was pretty famous. They tapped him. They said, we want you to be the director of the Human Genome Project. So he was the director. Now, the Human Genome Project was completed <coughs> April 2003, earlier than they thought. <coughs> That's when it was completed. And so now he does something different. Now he's the director of the National Center for Human Genome Research at the National Institutes of Health in Maryland, okay. NIH. You guys ever heard of NIH? There's a big group of people there, National Institutes of Health. Big group of people there, and they're working now on sifting through that stack of information as tall as the Washington Monument, sifting through it, looking for clues to things like cures for cancer cancers, cures for genetic diseases, looking through that, sorting through all that information. It's going to take a long time to sort through all of that. And so that's what the uh, National Center for Human Genome Research is doing, and he's heading that up. Now, he's kind of a rock star, you guys, in the world of genetics. Kind of a, a rock star. Let's go back here for a second. I remember, and, and that's almost literal, okay? I remember years ago, I was at 
a convention of the National Association of Biology Teachers in Atlanta, Georgia. That got biology teachers from all over the country gathering together. Sounds like a big nerd convention, doesn't it? No, not really. So here we were. The main speaker was Francis Collins. He was the main speaker. So in this big fancy hotel, you know, they had this big, like a convention hall, lots of seating, uh, hundreds of people in there. And Francis Collins was the speaker. And uh, kind of a rock star in the world of genetics. And at the end of his talk, he pulled out his guitar he writes these little, cute, funny little songs about genetics. He pulled out his guitar and started singing this song about DNA. And it was really funny, all the, all the biology teachers in the crowd and biology professors, they started to kind of rush the stage. So he is truly kind of literally a rock star, well, sort of. Now, he wrote this book years ago, a few years ago. It's called The Language of God. Okay, A Scientist Presents Evidence for Belief, The Language of God. So, an interesting book. And in that book, he talks about his own personal life, his own personal beliefs. But he also talks about the Human Genome Project and kind of how that was done. And it's a bestseller. It's written for the general public. You don't have to be a scientist to understand it. But, uh, He's got like a, an interesting message there. If you're interested in it, you might want to read it. But uh, he and I go way back, see? Well, he came to Purdue and did one of those evening lectures at Purdue that was open to the public. Mm -hmm. Everybody's all excited. So there were Purdue scientists there. There were people from the general public there. And there were some of my genetic students there. Because guess what? I told them, what do you think I told them? Since I knew Francis Collins was coming to town, what do you think I told him? Extra credit. Extra credit. Yeah, if you go and you take good notes, you know you can get extra credit. So I had some students go, and there are a couple of the students. Oh, she even bought her own copy of the book, and uh, he signed it for her. That was kind of cool. Actually, he signed my copy too. If there's a rock star around, you want to get them to sign the book, right? Yeah. Are either of them scientists now? What? Are either of them scientists now? Oh, good question. I don't know. That was 2000, spring of 2007. February. Okay. Um, wait, I think he's an EMT on an ambulance crew. Last time I talked to him. I'm not, not sure what she's doing. But you can see she was in the Jeff marching band. Oh, she played the flute. So, uh, not sure other than that. So, Human Genome Project. Now, I think we'll do this. Why don't you copy this information down right here at the bottom of this page. Three goals position it so you can see it. And then we'll talk about the three goals or phases of the Human Genome Project. It was done in three steps. So I'm going to let you write that information down. I tried to summarize them. First they developed what was called a genetic linkage map. And then they developed a physical map. And then finally, the last stage, the most difficult stage, working out the DNA sequence. In other words, the order of the A's and T's and C's and G's. So, can you guys, all of you in the back, can you see that pretty well? So a genetic linkage map. A map showing what genes are on what chromosomes and the order of those genes. Now, when they started, some linkage maps had already been partly produced based on crossing over frequencies, and we'll talk about that a little bit. The next step, develop a physical map, a map showing the exact 
distances between those genes on the chromosomes, produced using the tools of molecular genetics. And finally, the DNA sequence map, the complete sequence in order of the A's, T's, C's, and G's. That was the last step. 